uh, in a, one of the biggies, if you will, is a substantial effort was made to limit N NOS and define why you think something is not otherwise specified. Is there some disorder which, you, which is real, but you know, it's not available elsewhere, if you will. It's not, it's not a specific disorder. Uh, is it not elsewhere specified or not specified at all? Is it because of inadequate information? Whatever it is, state the reason, but we were not able to eliminate not otherwise specified completely. So you will still see it, but to a substantially uh, lesser extent. And again, uh, a substantial effort in terms of introducing dimensions. So these are the new, this is chapter one. Neurodevelopmental disorders in DSM-5. It addresses intellectual disabilities, no longer mental retardation. It's called intellectual disability. For those of you familiar uh, with the law, this is Rosa's law, which was passed uh, by Congress in 2010 and signed by the president uh, to relabel retardation or mental retardation uh, as intellectual disability. Near this particular chapter, intellectual disabilities, communication disorders, autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, specific learning disorders, motor disorders, and other neurodevelopmental disorders. So these are the entities that you have uh, in, uh, in this particular section in DSM-5. Intellectual disability, and I mentioned in ICD-11, it's going to be, the terminology is going to change. It's not going to be intellectual disability, it's going to be intellectual developmental disorder because everything has to have a disorder at the end of it in ICD-11. So that terminology will change with ICD-11. By the way, ICD-11 is likely to be introduced. It, it was supposed to be next year. Uh, and now they've postponed the launch to 2016. My expectation is that we're not going to see it till 2018 because the field trials in ICD-11 are taking longer than they anticipated. Uh, so mental retardation, renamed intellectual disability, and the concept, too, has changed substantially. A, no, no more borderline intellectual functioning, if you will. Uh, definition based on two different issues with a greater emphasis on adaptive functioning rather than just on IQ scores. To meet uh, the, the uh, criteria, you need a deficit of two or more standard deviations on an individualized, standardized, culturally appropriate test of intellectual function. And the coding of severity is significantly based on adaptive functioning in three domains, conceptual domain, social domain, and a practical domain. And no more borderline intellectual functioning, if you will. So w what's covered in the conceptual domain? The ability to learn, information processing, approach to problem solving. And if you look at the manual, you will see A, a description of what this is at the level of mild, uh, moderate, severe, uh, if you will, uh, and profound. So those four degrees of, uh, four levels of severity, there are specific uh, statements of exactly what it, what it uh, is entailed to meet uh, mild or moderate criteria in the conceptual domain with some case discussion as well. So, so in the conceptual domain, ability to learn information processing approach to problem solving. Social domain, social interaction, communication, social cues, emotional regulation, social judgment. In the practical domain, personal care, daily living tasks, uh, ability to perform age appropriate roles. And the other thing to keep in mind is there are in these descriptions for different age groups you have statements about what the different levels of imp impairment in each of these domains looks like. And, and, and again, severity based on the degree of needed assistance and support for the individual. Now this was one of the more controversial changes, emanated a lot of controversy, so let me kind of briefly address that uh, if I can. A new uh, autism spectrum disorder, which encompasses DSM-IV's autistic disorder, Asperger's disorder, 
childhood disintegration disorder, and pervasive developmental disorder. No more separate red disorder, but you'll see if you've got red disorders and you meet the criteria for autism, uh, autism spectrum disorder, you will get a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And if, in fact, you've been diagnosed as having RETS, there's a specifier which says RETS disorder, if you will. But it's not a separate disorder because the clinical presentation is autism spectrum disorder, if you will. Uh, in any event, most of, I mean all, of DSM-IV's autistic disorder will still be called, will be part of autism spectrum disorder. A significant chunk of Asperger's disorder will be autism spectrum disorder. Some will not, but there is a different diagnosis, if you will. Childhood disintegration disorder, PDD, NOS, will all be part of autism spectrum disorder. Why was this change made? Two major reasons. One, data do not suggest clear distinctions between these disorders. There's no categorical separation between them. They're related, if you will. It causes clinical confusion, if you will. And so that was the principal reason for essentially developing this entity of autism spectrum disorder instead of these four separate disorders, if you will. And there are two domains, deficits in social communication interaction and a second domain of restrictive and repetitive behavior patterns. And there are three levels of severity. So if you've got autism spectrum disorder, you make that diagnosis, and then you describe the level of severity, which is based on the need for supportive services. You need supportive services, but these are not substantial, that's mild. If you need substantial supportive services, that's moderate. And very substantial, that's severe. And there are descriptions, again, of exactly what that means. And these are the specifiers, which I think are, are, are very useful, because you can see autism spectrum disorder with or with, without accompanying intellectual impairment. Asperger's, for example, often is without. So if you want to make those distinctions, you can, but in a clinically more meaningful way. With or without accompanying language impairment. So that's another specifier. Associated with known medical or genetic condition or environmental factor. Example, RETS. So if you've got RETS, diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder with RETS as a, as a specifier. Associated with another neurodevelopmental, mental or behavioral disorder. This was the change which the scientific review committee did not want to make. A fair, not a fair amount, but you do see autism, with, you do see catatonia in some individuals with severe autism uh, or, or disorders. Now why is that important? Because there are specific treatments for catatonia and there are specific interventions which are relevant and often clinicians who are dealing with uh, autism, uh, autistic disorder for example or now autism spectrum disorder don't think of them because there's no way of identifying and coding catatonia if you will. Now there will be uh, in terms of autism spectrum disorder if you've got catatonia and there's a definition that's provided, you will code autism spectrum disorder with catatonia. Communication disorder. So this is where that 5 to 10 percent of Asperger's that will not be part of autism spectrum disorder will go. So there's this new category, social pragmatic communication disorder, and that's where they'll be uh, diagnosed, if you will. But these are the communication disorders. Language disorder, speech sound disorder, Childhood onset fluency disorder uh, and social communi uh, com uh, pragmatic communication disorder, if you will. Uh, ADHD, some import, I don't know how, to what extent you're going to get into a discussion of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, although not at all, or as a comorbidity, you might, I mean, I don't know if you will or will not at all, but, and so I, I can skip the slide. So, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in DSM 4. Symptoms should have begun by the age of seven. And in DSM-5, that's been revised to symptoms should have begun by the age of 12. In significant part, because your recollection of what happens before the age of seven, not very good, but even more importantly, the symptoms, the problems are first become apparent during the schooling years, early schooling years, if, if you will. And so requiring symptoms to have been identified before the age of seven, 
might actually exclude a significant number of individuals who might actually have this particular problem. So that's one change. Uh, there is a slight modification of criteria to accommodate adult ADHD. So when you, whereas you need six of nine in symptoms uh, of hyperactivity, of six or nine symptoms of inattention, if you will, to meet criteria uh, in children, uh, for adults, it's five of nine, if you will. So that's, uh, that's uh, a change that's been made. And the severity is based on number and severity of symptoms and the impact on uh, uh, impact on function. And very importantly, if you meet f six, or six, of n six or more of nine of both, then you'll, you'll be diagnosed in terms of specifier as, ha as having the combined presentation of ADHD. Because you, have, you meet criteria for ADHD, uh, both for inattention and hyperactivity. If you meet one, but have more than four symptoms of the other, uh, essentially in three if for adults, then you'll have uh, that diagnosis, but predominantly this or predominantly that, if you will. Uh, specific learning disorder, if you recall what happened in D what you had in DSM-4, <coughs> you had mathematics disorder, a calculia, dyscalculia, things of that sort. What was realized is that a significant number of children with different learning disorders actually may have had more problems in a particular area, but they had significant learning difficulties in multiple areas. But if they were diagnosed as having dyscalculia, for example, that's the only attention they received. And the other problems were ignored, not addressed, if you will. So now, specific learning disorder is presented as a single disorder with coded specifiers for these specific deficits, if you will. Uh, some other, this is probably the last or last, uh, second to last slide. Other disorders which were in this section but have been moved <coughs> to other parts of DSM, PICA, separation anxiety, disorder, separation anxiety disorder, selective mutism, for example, moved to the anxiety disorders chapter. Uh, RETS, you know, in autism spectrum disorder, with RETS as a specifier, if that's what it is. In the PTSD section, now you have uh, an allowance uh, addition of preschool PTSD uh, in this PTSD section. It's called the trauma and stress-related disorders. Another very controversial change, if you will, was the addition of disruptive mood dysregulation disorder uh, in the mood disorder, se in mood disorder section <coughs> or the dis uh, depressive disorder section, if you will. Very controversial because many reasons why this was controversial. One, because there, were, there was only one group actually which has done most of the research in this particular uh, disorder. And one of the things that we, DSM-5 really required was that there should be multiple groups studying that particular condition because then you can be more confident uh, in terms of the nature of that condition, the uh, definition of that condition. The other problem was the field trials showed extremely poor reliability for disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. So that was another problem with this particular uh, 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 disorder, if you will. The third, there's always concern about children and the possibility of excessive use of psychotherapeutic medications amongst children. I mean, that's always a concern. And this was the concern that adding this you know, you're going to be diagnosing children with temper tantrums, and uh, except for the individuals in this particular room, almost all other individuals have had at least one tantrum as a child. Uh, so, I mean, the fact that you, uh, w would you be diagnosing, uh, you know, everybody? And as adults, too. <laughs> and as adults, too. Remember, there's not a mood disorder section, so it's in the, the depressive section. Depressive disorder section, yeah, yeah. It's a, it, there is no mood disorder section, exactly. It's in the depressive disorder section. Now, one of the significant drivers of this, of course, was that bipolar disorders, the diagnosis of bipolar disorders in children has increased fivefold since DSM-4. And that, this addition should probably help address, contain that particular issue, but it remains to be seen. Uh, actually, I should rephrase this. 
impulse control disorders have now been combined with conduct disorder and oppositional defined disorder. Those are the main disorders in that particular category. Uh, but impulse control disorders in adulthood, for example, have been combined with that particular category. No real changes for motor disorder. Now a separate section for elimination disorders, separate section for feeding and eating disorders, where pica actually goes in. Uh, this is the last slide, and this is just closing on a more general personal note. I mean, I, uh, I, I believe classification is very important. I believe uh, sets of diagnostic criteria really speak to where we are at as a field, if you will, in defining the conditions that we try and help uh, mankind with. And so I think classification is important. This was the process that I went into with great hope and great enthusiasm. And really the aspiration, and it wasn't just me, most of the people that I worked with felt, hey, we're going to be spending a heck of a lot of time uh, in terms of this work. Uh, we, we're really going to catch up with the rest of medicine. And we, just as the rest of medicine defines different disorders based on a specific cause, a specific pathology, uh, you know, essentially that's what we, and a specific test, that's what we're going to do. We're going to be able to really move the field substantially towards a more etiopathophysiological classification with multiple validators, with biological markers. And we're really going to be able to capture the dimensional nature of psychopathology in a very, very effective way. Uh, and, it's, it, it's, and we're going to be able to do all of this and substantially simplify uh, the manual at the same time. And really, it's, we, if validity is going to be our contribution. Like DSM-3 made this contribution of reliability, this is what we're going to do in terms of DSM-5. And what we realized, uh, this was a very humbling process. And we realized, A, that to improve validity while simplifying, while improving reliability, and making sure that everything is simple and clinically applicable in routine clinical settings is an impossible task. I mean, it's very, very difficult to do all of these things at the same time. We realize that the, we have generated a lot of information, but we still don't know enough to be able to move as far as we might want to move. Uh, and it was very important that we only move as far as we could, as was appropriate for us to move based on the information we have. And so the changes in DSM-5 are modest. Uh, hopefully, clinicians will say that this is a more useful system. Clinically, it's more relevant. Clinically, it's more useful. Clinically, it's more applicable. Uh, hopefully they will find it simpler. I, I think it is, uh, but I'm biased, uh, if you will. Uh, so this is what we see with DSM-5. Dimensional assessments, mainly in uh, Section 3, are available. I can speak at length to the dimensional assessments in psychotic disorders, for example. Uh, I think they're going to be very, very useful, if you will, at the same time, fairly practical. But this is the level at which we're at. Some modest improvement in validity. And the other thing that I think, hopefully, when we look back at DSM-5, uh, we might be able to say is, you know, rather than being an impediment to research development, if you will, maybe this will be a better bridge to an etiopathophysiology uh, 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 in the future. That is, dimensions mapping on to endophenotypes that might relate to specific genetic environmental factors. Hopefully, that is what we will see in terms of the contribution of DSM-5. Thank you all for your attention.